Okay, open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2, and we will continue on in verses 12 through 15, four verses there. How many times did your mom have to tell you to brush your teeth? You remember that when you were a little kid? Did you brush your teeth? No, I didn't. I, I, I do that with my grandchildren. Usually I'll wake up early in the morning and a few of them want to go to Starbucks with me. Can I go with you? And so I said, yeah, sure, let's go. And so we sit in the car and all of a sudden you can smell their breath, you know, through the night. You don't smell the mint, you know. And so you ask them, did you brush your teeth? And they just look at you. So I stop the car and go back to the car, go brush your teeth, you know. How many times did your mom have to tell you to brush your teeth? Little kid uh, was taken to the dentist. They found that he had a, a cavity and it needed to be filled. So the doctor asked him, uh, um, what would you like me to fill your cavity with? And the little kid said, how about some chocolate? <laughs> yeah, that is exactly why you got a cavity is because you eat candy and sweets all day long. So brush your teeth. That's the, that's the theme of this message today is brush your teeth. Now, we saw last week uh, the two areas that Peter was touching, the first four verses, touching the fact of what God has done for us, which is a lot, right? I mean, he sent his son out of love for us, and his son died on the cross for us, and he has given us eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. He has pretty much done everything for us. He's done all the work that, that ever needs to be done so that we could have eternal life. And then he gives us his divine nature, and he tells us in the few verses after, 5 through 11, that we are to respond And we are to respond out of obedience and love to our God. In other words, our part of the deal. And that is we are to be obedient to God. That is so important, is our obedience. We have to make the choice. We need to choose to obey God rather than man. That is such a hard choice. It's so simple to say, and we can repeat it, but to literally do it is the difficulty, to obey God rather than men. And then Peter then begins to reveal his state here in these few verses, 12 through 15, his purpose for even writing this tiny little epistle of three chapters and also 1 Peter. He is approaching death, and so he's pouring his heart out knowing that soon he will literally be gone. And and when you're in that situation and you know that that you will be leaving and the audience will no longer be there, nor will they see you, uh, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to really pour your heart out. And that's why I poured my heart out earlier, not that I'm dying, but that I want you to see my heart for this community and I need that commitment from you uh, to understand the purpose that God has brought you here because I believe that God divinely brings us to places. And if you're here, I think he brought you here divinely. And you have to make a choice whether you're going to stick it out or whether you're not going to stick it out. You have to make that choice. And if you make the choice to stick it out, then you need to stick it out. You need to commit yourself to what God is doing in your life and in the ministry that he's called you to because that's how it's worked ever since the very beginning. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, he uses church. Church is the function by which he reaches the world. You have to be in church. You have to be a part of church. You have to be in ministry in order to reach the world and impact the world. That's the way God has planned it to be. No other way, but we're pulling away from that. We think we can do it other ways. Well, Peter is pouring his heart out here as he writes in verse 12 through 15. Let's go ahead and read those verses and then we will uh, interpret them and apply them to our lives. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth, yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease, or death, in other words. Now, Peter is more than likely in prison waiting to be executed, and so he writes this with the utmost urgence, uh, knowing that he will be deceased in a few minutes. Two points that I want to make this morning. Let me remind you. Let me remind you. It's okay to remind you. 
It's okay to be reminded. You shouldn't be offended. If you're doing it, great, wonderful, praise God, continue on. If you're not doing it, then be reminded to begin to do it again. Get excited about it. Build that passion again for it. You know, but it is my responsibility, and as Peter said, it would be a neglect on my part if I don't remind you of these truths. And then second, we're heaven bound. Peter was heaven bound. And so while he was here on earth, he had a job to do, and he was committed to do that job before he went to heaven. So let me remind you, let me remind you, verse 12, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Now, things is a lot of things. But the word remind there means to put another in mind of something to cause one to remember. And so to stir up in them a remembrance of what they should be doing as believers. Now, you remember in, 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 in the first book uh, of Peter, he was speaking to a persecuted church. And in a sense, he was encouraging and strengthening them because of that persecution, because they were losing hope. And here in Second Peter, he's reminding them of these same truths as he now is ending his life and they will be challenged with many obstacles. In chapter 2, he's going to talk about the false teachers that will arise, the false doctrines that were there. Chapter 3, he's going to talk about the end, the Lord coming back soon, and so forth. And so a lot of challenges for us, uh, challenges for us today. I don't know if you know what they're doing in Israel right now. But they have surrounded Israel, and they have rockets pointed at Israel, and they're firing missiles every single day into Israel. And these rockets can reach any part of Israel now. Uh, they showed a, a, a plot plan of the whole nation, and they showed the rockets from Hamas, and they showed them reaching all the red area, and the whole state was red, the whole state. Do you know what that means? And I don't mean to alarm us of these situations, but the Bible tells us that when we want to know the times and the seasons, we need to look at Israel and what's happening in Israel. Not at the United States, not at our president. Who cares what we're going through? We're not even in prophecy. We're under grace and God's graciousness as a nation. But the rest of the world in Israel is the prophetic picture of our end. And we need to be aware of that. What's happening there right now is prophetic. God could come at any time. He can come before this message is over and he spare you, by the way, of this message. Because it's a tough one. He could come at any moment and we're out of here and the Antichrist will raise up and he will bring peace to Israel because right now is a perfect time to bring peace because they're not in peace. And Israel is attacking Hamas. They know that within their own mosque, they're storing missiles. And so now they're going to attack these mosques. Uh, and they're not going to back down. They're going to fight for their sovereignty. And so we need to understand the days that we're living in. And Peter here says, for this reason, I don't want to be neglectful as a pastor, as an apostle, as entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ to instruct the saints of the things that are true for us as believers. Now, what things are you talking about? Well, there are so many truths within the scriptures from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Is he talking within the context of his own little book? Well, you notice that when he makes the statement in the next statement that though you know and are established in the present truth, he's not necessarily talking about the present truth. We understand our present truth at this moment, but I want to talk to you about all truth. And how it pertains to us. He said earlier, it pertains to godliness in our life and so forth. So, so everything. I remind you of all of God's truth. I remind you to be on time. To remind you to read your word. This is a Bible teaching church. And we teach from the scriptures. You should have a Bible. This is Calvary Chapel. We go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You should have a Bible in your hands right now. And you should be looking at it and reading it and not trusting me to read it to you. That's what we believe because this is a personal book. You know that the Jewish people will take the Torah and they will give it to their children at a certain age and they will tell them, this is yours do with it whatever you want. And that child will take it, lick it, suck it, play with it, write in it, scribble on it. But they're making a point to that child. This is your Bible. This is personal. And it's your 
speaks of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to get a Bible if you don't have one. And we shouldn't supply it for you. I mean, they're there, you forget yours, uh, you, we, we know that. We find them in the back here all the time too. You know, but this is a personal Bible. You need to go buy one and you need to put your name in it and you need to be reading it and marking it up. It's interesting because the Lord really ministered to me personally. And I've gotten this little Bible, uh, a little phrase that I put there, New Beginnings. Um, he told me to get a new Bible. He says, you need to be refreshed. You need to be reborn born again, in a sense, and you need to, to, a new life again, and I really needed that word from the Lord at this pastor's conference, I really did, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and you can get stagnant, uh, you can get into the routine, and the Lord was really saying, I am going to refresh you, and so I took my other Bible that has 20 something years worth of notes, and I'm like, ah, and he said, here's a new one, and I want you to start over again, because I'm going to minister to you, this is the word of God, and that's the truth. We should be in the word of God. We should be praying. We should be seeking God. We should be expecting him to minister to us. These are truths. And it's important that I remind you of this, otherwise I'd be negligent. The Bible is filled with uh, reminders in a sense. You know, you get those little post-its, post-its, you know, and you put them on your refrigerator, you put them in your Bible, you put them on your car dash, you put them everywhere, what? To remind you of them. I was speaking to a, a sister out there, and she said, thank you for the message. It was really simple and relevant, because I forget a lot, and I need to remind it. And she said, I even put post-its all over the place, but I forget where I put them. <laughs> and so I still forget, you know, my grocery list and other things. I go, I know how you feel. I put it on my phone, and then I forget I put it on my phone, and I don't even look at my phone. You know, we, we make all kinds of reminders, but then we forget that we have reminders. We need a reminder to remind us that we have a reminder to remind us of these things, in a sense. <laughs> but the Scriptures... Um, definitely teach that we need to be reminded periodically. Paul, speaking to the Corinthians in chapter 4, 17, said this, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. It's good to have beloved, faithful sons in the Lord. I was really blessed this pastor's conference. Where's Randy's not here, so I can talk about him. There was a couple of guys that were with us, and one of them was a pastor. He kind of hung around with us the whole time. And he texted me afterwards, the whole conference over, and he said, what a blessing. Thank you for inviting us and spending time with us and so forth. And then he said this, he said this, I was really ministered to by Randy. By Randy. He says, that guy served the whole time we were there. He served. He served us. And he goes, and he served you. He says, that guy loves you. I'm like, I know. That's why I want to take care of him. And I love him back. And he's that Timothy. He's that faithful son in the Lord that's there to serve. And what an example that he impacted a senior pastor's life, you know. That's amazing. And that blessed me. That blessed me a lot. And Paul said, I've sent Timothy there. Why? Who will remind you of the ways of Christ. And that's what Randy does with these ushers. And he's like, you're a servant, you know. I know he gets, he gets on you one, once in a while, you know, and gets you moving because you guys will be out there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Randy, what are you doing? Get moving, you know. It's like, because he's a servant. And he's there to remind us of these truths that we're not here to, to just, you know, relax and just kick back, you know, but we're here to serve. And not that these guys don't serve, you know, but, but that's the way his heart is. And so Timothy was like that. You know, he would get in there and he'd remind them of everything that Paul taught about. He was like following him. And so Paul would go into the new ministry and then Timothy would come right after him. Now, remember what Paul said. Remember you're, you need to do those things. Remember you need to set things in order. You remember you need to be, you know, and just doing that over and over again. We see in Jude, Jude writes that I want to remind you, though you once knew this, you know, and that's often the case when reminding, right? You already know it. And so you get those little remarks. I know that already. I understand that. So why aren't you doing it then? Why aren't you taking out the trash? I have to ask you. I know, I heard you a while ago. Well, was it out yet? Well, no. <laughs> okay, so I'm reminding you again. And you have to remind them all the way out to the side of the house until they put it on the street. You know, otherwise they'll forget so quickly. And Judah's saying there, I want to remind you, though you already know this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And he's warning the reader. 
Look, I have to warn you and remind you. I know you know this. You know the whole story of Egypt, and you know how the people came out of Egypt, and they went to the Mount Sinai, but I had to destroy. The Lord had to destroy the unbelieving ones because immediately they began to make a calf because Moses was gone, and they doubted. And as a reminder, don't doubt. Believe. Trust in God. Know that He will fulfill His promises to us. And so it would be negligent on my part if I don't remind you of these truths. Then he says, though you know and are established in the present truth. Now, um, you're established, in other words, you're stable, you're strong in them, you know what you believe, uh, there's not an issue there, but the issue is, is that you're not applying them. And, and that really is where the rubber hits the road. That's where it really matters, is the application. Oh, I know we believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, I know that we're going to heaven, you know, but what are you doing for him? Well, I know I should be serving. Well, are you? No, I'm not. Well, then you need to get busy serving. You need to start praying about it. And if you don't know where the Lord is leading you, then get involved in an opening. You're in a church. There's opportunities. Get involved and then watch how the Lord leads and guides you. Now, we have a requirement here that you have to be here at least six months. And that's so that we can get to know you and you, us, and, and, and our guidelines and the commitment and so forth. You know, so just keeping in line with, with all of that. And so it's important that you get firm and established in your application. And then he He says in the next statement here, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent. So again, he goes back to the fact that he's leaving and that it's important that he say this before he leaves because uh, he'll be gone completely. So therefore, we as dads have an obligation. We as pastors have an obligation. Even though it might be the same thing over and over and over again, we want to make sure that it is established within your heart, that you grasp it, that you know what we're saying, and that you know you have a responsibility yourselves to the Lord to act upon the truth in obedience to Him instead of getting upset. Years ago, we used to have an afterglow. And afterglow is, is when we allow the gifts of the Spirit to flow and there will be prophecy, there will be tongues and the gifts will flow, uh, discernment and so forth. We had one at the pastor's conference and it was, it was awesome. The gifts of tongues were flowing, the interpretation was right on, prophecy was being spoken, you know, healing was taking place. I mean, it was just an awesome time where the Spirit moved. And so we were trying to cultivate that here within the church, that we need the Spirit of God so greatly in order to do anything. And this night, it didn't go quite well. We had an individual that had his own ideas of what uh, tongues were and the interpretation of tongues. And so I corrected the individual, and he made a big scene about it. And that that was fine. We just don't speak tongues anymore until we are firmly established in what the Scriptures say. Well, that individual eventually left, and so we continued on with our afterglow. And so I made it a point to remind us, okay, this is how we speak in tongues according to scriptures, two or three speak, and then let there be an interpretation, and that interpretation will always be a magnification of God. And so I I made that point, and it was fine the first time, and and we went ahead and, and did the afterglow, then the next month we did it again, and I reminded them again. You know, and so forth. Then finally, some individual came up to me and said, you know, I'm tired of hearing that over and over again. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to make sure that we understand and it's established in our hearts. So, so instead of getting upset, she should have said, I agree with you. That is what scripture says. But they got upset. And so they ended up leaving and going to a vineyard. And if you know anything about the vineyard church, they're very much into the gifts of the Spirit and emotionalism, and they just let it run rampant. And so she felt at home there, you know, to do whatever she wanted to do and not necessarily what the Scripture said. Well, eventually she stopped going there. And now she don't go anywhere. She just stays at home. You know, those are the individuals that come up with their own ideas, their own interpretation, and eventually the evidence that they're wrong is in the end when they're not even going to church at all, you know? And instead of receiving the reminder and the encouragement that you're on track and that we should stay with the truth, because what happens when we're not reminded? We forget. We forget, don't we? Did you brush your teeth in the morning? Oh, yeah, I forgot. You know? Did you put gas in the car? Oh, yeah, I was supposed to do that. I forgot. We forget. We're creatures that just forget all the time. 
I was supposed to bring that shirt this morning. I forgot it. So I called Virginia. Are you still home? Yeah. Can you grab that shirt for me? Because I forgot it. We just forget. And so we need to be reminded at all times to establish that truth within us. And it's not necessarily uh, new truth, but it's old truth with new truth and in a fresh and a new way so that we can be passionate about that new truth just as uh, Roman was sharing you know these guys are 25 years old I remember when Greg first started the Harvest Crusade I was there at the very first one and it was an exciting thing Pastor Chuck had this vision and he asked Greg to be the evangelist at the event and from that point on it just went from there Chuck paid for the first crusade all himself from Costa Mesa and I was there at that one and it was exciting now 25 years later here it's still going these guys are bald and gray you know, good thing they're white because you can't tell the gray from the blonde. You know, if you're Hispanic, you can. One day I'll be all white, you know, and you'll just know I'm old. But these guys are still going. But the same message, the same truth, you know, reaching the generation of today. And that's what Peter is talking about, that truth. And so he says, yes, I think it is right as long as I am this tent. Now, heaven bound. He knew he was heaven bound. Uh, By his statement here, he uses the word tent. Tent in the Greek is dwelling. It's a temporary housing, right? It's not a permanent housing. Uh, You go camping and you set up a tent because you're not planning on staying there forever, just for the weekend or just for a week. When we were kids, we would literally throw a, a line across two trees. We'd get some plastic and we'd throw the plastic over the line and we'd make an A frame tent. And we would crawl in between there and we would stay there at least until 12 because then we got scared and had to run back inside. But that was a tent. It wasn't lasting. You know, by the next morning, my mom said, get rid of that line and that tent. It doesn't belong there. Uh, we had tents over here in Ontario. There was a, a homeless commu- community there and they would set up all their tents. But of course, even though they were there for years, eventually they had to tear it all down because of the crime and the events that were going on at the place. And they said, get rid of it all. It's a temporary. So these bodies are temporary. Peter's saying, this tent that I dwell in is temporary and it is going to be gone. And so I'm going to preach it to you while I have your attention, while you can see me and while I can speak. And so be ready ready to hear what I'm about ready to say as a warning to you. Now he says, I want to stir up or stir you up by reminding you. Now the, the word stir there literally means to wake up, to wake up. We need that once in a while, to wake up. And we wake up by reminder. You know, we were at the pastor's conference and <clears throat> that's a difficult place to teach at when you really think about it, Right? Here you are, you're a pastor, and you are teaching to who? Pastors. And pastors that read the Word, study the Word, teach twice a week, if not three times a week. They're into the Greek, they're into the Hebrew, they're into the tenses and so forth. And there you are, you're trying to teach them. They already know it. What do you teach a pastor, you know? You know what they taught? The very basic stuff that we already know. From what I heard, it was, are you passionate for the Lord? Or have you lost that passion? That's simple stuff. I already know that, but the question was brought out. I could have said, well, why are you teaching me that? I've already heard this stuff. No, I took it personally and I asked myself, are you passionate about this? Or are you not? And it's interesting because the Lord spoke to me personally on that topic. A couple weeks earlier, I went to lunch with another pastor and I asked the pastor, what can I pray for you for? And so they gave me a prayer request and said, I'll, I'll be praying for you. And then he asked me, what can I pray for you? And you know what I told him? I said, passion. I said, I'd like to, you know, get some of that passion back when I first got saved. Now, I know I won't get it all back because I was radical. I mean, I was like a Jesus freak. I mean, I mean, radical. If you can think of a radical Christian that you know of, I was worse than that. I know I won't get that back because there's some, some of that knowledge that, that kind of Holds back that zeal a little bit now that I'm older and so forth. But that was my request. And almost immediately, the first thing that Damien and Kyle was talking about was the passion for the ministry. And I'm thinking, wow, Lord, you set this up. You know, especially for me, to minister to me, to remind me that we're to be passionate about the Word of God, passionate to the people and relevant and challenging them for the work that God has for us. So stirring it up, that word can also mean 
a calm sea and literally causing it to be turbulent, you know, turbulent, just like I'm doing today. Some of you might be offended of what I said by this challenge, and that's okay. That's okay. Hopefully, you'll take it back and you'll, you'll ask, is this real? Is this true? Is this what's going on in my own life? There was a, we went to one workshop and a pastor um, raised his hand with a question. He said, can you give me some insight on what to do in this situation? He said, I'm in the church, eight months, taking it over, and the people are just divided. They're angry at me, there's accusations, they're, they're talking, there's gossip, and I almost didn't make it here to the, to the pastor's uh, conference. I was thinking of just staying home, trying to figure out what's going on here. And the person teaching the, the workshop said this to him, is it true? <laughs> that was the first thing. I'm like, wow, that was compassionate. It was like, is it true? Are you that way? If you are, then you need to find out what you need to do to change that. Because there's always a little bit of truth in things. You know? And he challenged them almost immediately. In my head, I was thinking, welcome to the ministry. That's not going to be the last time. <laughs> you know, that's going to happen you know, every two years. You know, when people get disgruntled and, you know, complacent and, you know, and so forth, you know. But then he said, even if it's not true, then you need to trust in the Lord. You need to just stay focused and preach the message and clean house as best you can. Get rid of the troublemakers, cut them out like cancer, and start over if you need to, if you know your calling and so forth. You know? It's difficult, but you sometimes have to stir things up. Stirring things up can also cause cleansing to happen too, right? It can cause cleansing. That's what happened in Egypt. Here all the, the children of Israel are before the mountain and Moses goes up and, and you know, they're asking Aaron, where's Moses? All right, he's not here. Let's make ourselves a God. And they took all their gold and they created a calf and start worshiping. worshiping. Moses comes down. He could have said, oh, why are you guys, well, okay, I understand. Yeah, I was gone for a long time. I'll be a little tolerant here. Yeah, you know, we can get along. Okay, we'll forgive you guys and just don't do it no more. And that wasn't, and he stirred things up. What are you doing? I wasn't gone that long. And already you're into idolatry. You know, you need to cut this out. You know, Aaron, what happened? I don't know. We just took gold, poof, and there it was. You know, it's like, come on, that's not an answer. You know, you know what happened. And then Korah says, well, who are you, Moses. We're just as gifted as you. I love that when people think that. Well, we're just as, and you know what? You're probably more gifted than I am, but God didn't call you to this position. God called me. And that's what basically what Moses says. Look, God called me here, not me. Tell you what, tomorrow let's meet. You stand on your side, I'll stand on my side. Let's let God decide. God decided. He opened up the earth and swallowed them all. You know, stirring it up. And God made the choice. It was Moses. It was Moses. You know, grow up. Grow up, stirring, reminding you, because I'm not going to be here much longer. Why do you think they put the speed limit 65 on the freeway? You know, you get on the on-ramp. The speed limit is 65. And then what? Half a mile later, what does it say? 65. It hasn't changed. What do you mean? And then a half a mile later, what? 65. Why do they do that? Because they know you're going to speed, and they need to remind you what the speed limit is. It's 65. I know, but I'm going 75. You know. <laughs> They're offending me by telling me it's 65. I already know that. Why do they keep telling me that? You know? and, and, of course, then they really remind you when you see the lights flashing. And the guy comes up and says, do you know what the speed limit is? No, I wasn't born in this country. I have no idea. What's the speed limit? <laughs> you know? Of course I know what it is. Then you know you were speeding. Yes, I know I was speeding. But some of us thought, was I really Oh, I'm sorry, officer. I, you know what? I must have been on my cell phone. Oh, did you know that you can't pee on your cell phone? You know, we, we forget so fast. And so we set up those little post-its all over the place, you know, and, and various things like that because we forget so fast. We forget what we ought to remember and we remember what we ought to forget. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And so we need to remember we're in a spiritual warfare. We're battling. The stakes are high and the enemy is deceitful and we need to know the truth. We need to be in the truth. Otherwise... We're heading towards destruction because sin always leads towards destruction. No matter what, sin leads towards destruction. It has to be 
paid. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. There's a wage. And by the way, even though you're a Christian, if you sin, there's still a wage to be paid. But Jesus paid for it. Yes, you have eternal life, but there's still a wage to be paid. You're going to suffer the, the, the reaping of what you sowed. And that's why you should stay away from those sins. Otherwise, you then will begin to suffer the repercussions of your choices, of your sin in your life. And that's how the enemy is. And so if you decide to gossip, you know, hey, I'm sorry, I apologize. There's still repercussions. No one trusts you. And it's already gone out and it's spreading as though it's truth. It's because sin always needs to be paid. It's paid ultimately for eternal life by Christ. But if we sin now, and the truth is, we will suffer the consequences. And so that's why some of us are suffering, because we have sinned, and it's now taking its effect on us. Sin doesn't always pay us immediately, and it's not like wages, you know, okay, I sin for a week, and Friday I get my re- results of sinning. Sometimes it's tens of years. You know, sometimes it's 20 years, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're ready to die. You've got cancer of the lungs because you've been smoking all your life, you know, and now it's caught up to you remind you the enemy's out there he wants to destroy and and kill us and so we need to repeat these things practice these things remind you to do those things just like a boxer you know a boxer practices so that it becomes what natural you know a guy doesn't say hey i want to box okay well where do you train nowhere i just want to box and man 30 seconds into the round you're on the ground you have no idea that's why they sit there for hours You ever watch them just do that just all day long? Why are they doing that? So when they're in the rings, their reflexes are fast and it's natural. You know, why do they do this? You know, they're just sitting there doing this all day long. You know, they go out to dinner and they're still doing, why are you, it's so natural, you know. The wife says, the wife goes, honey, and he goes, oh, you know. (laughs) Because it's natural, they're doing it all their lives, you know. The kids come up, dad, and he goes, oh yeah, I got you right there, you know. Counter punch, you know, round that because it becomes natural. So when we take the truth and we practice it, we're reminded to practice and practice, it becomes natural to us. And then we're blessed because of it. So he goes on in verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Now he was aware of this because Jesus had spoke about it in the gospel, John chapter 21 of what kind of death he would die. And so he knew what kind of death he would die. And he knew that it was a prophetic death that Jesus gave to him personally and that his time was up. And so he said, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Boy, he was... He really wanted to make sure you, <laughs> you heard what he said. He goes, he goes, you know what? I'm going to hound you even after I'm dead. I'm going to make sure he, that I'm reminding you even after I'm deceased. And the word deceased there is actually exodus. And he's using that word for the children of Israel exiting out of Egypt to the promised land. And so what he's saying, I'm going to exit the world and into the heavenly promised land. And so I want to make sure that you are reminded constantly, every time you read First Peter, every time you read Second Peter, that you're reminded of the truths. And so that's why you get into the Word of God. And Peter is hounding you today. Be reminded of the truths. You husbands love your wives. You wives respect your husbands. You men, be priests of your homes, be leaders of your churches and your community. You set the standards, you set the pace, you are the men. You wives respect and honor and train your children to respect and honor their husbands and your daughters to find the godly man that they need to find so that when they marry them they can continue on in serving the Lord. You in the ministries, be faithful, be committed, be strong in the Lord, for there's a work to be done. These are truths that we all need to be committed to, unto the Lord Jesus Christ, before we're all gone. There were many interviews of Pastor Chuck. Greg Laurie did one, and he asked him, what would you say to Calvary Chapel? Now that you're ending at the end of your life, and you know what he said? Stay the course. Those were weighty words. Because to this day, when I go to meetings, you will often hear those same words. Pastor Chuck said, stay the course. What do you mean by that? We're Calvary Chapel. We're unique. 
There are not a lot of churches like us. We believe that the Bible is the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, so we teach it that way. We teach that every word is important that God spoke. And so we go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and in my case, statement by statement, you know, to make sure that we get the whole counsel of God. And we should be excited about that. Other churches don't do that. You'll come Sunday mornings, and I saw an advertisement for a church in their community. Come and learn some valuable spiritual insights. We will be reviewing the movie, blah, blah, blah. That's where they're getting their insights from, a review of a movie. They're uh, valuable insights. Yeah, I could learn a lot from the Godfather. <laughs> you know? I'll make them a deal, can't you know, Dinner. <clears throat> a movie. No, we're unique. And so stay the course means stay the course. We're not a denomination. We're not, we're not um, connected to another Calvary in such a way that we govern over each other. We're unique in that we govern over our own church, this church here in this community. But we are unique in that we fellowship one with another knowing that this is the word of God. We go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And there's certain doctrines that we adhere to, like predestination. I'm sorry, uh, the pre-tribulation, that we will be raptured out of here before the tribulation starts. That's an important doctrine, you know, the rapture, you know, the various other doctrines, that we're not Calvinists and we're not Arminius, we're in the middle. And yeah, we believe God elects us, but we also believe God gives us a choice. You know, how that all works is interesting. So stay the course was his last words, his last words. And so I think we need to adhere to what Peter is saying here is that we shouldn't get upset to be reminded of these things. And if you're sitting there going, I've heard this before, then receive it. Receive it and apply it to your lives. Let me close. Peter really wants his readers to overlearn, to overlearn the basic truth so that when he passes, that truth will not be forgotten in their lives. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then today's the day that you need to accept him into your heart. You need to ask Christ to come into your heart deeply and cause you to be born again, to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. There has to be that born again experience because Jesus told Nicodemus, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Unless your mindset changes, unless you are in a different direction, if you have turned from your old life to your new life, then you are born again. Now, if you are a Christian and you have got complacent and you've gone back to your old life, and as Peter said, dog returning to its own vomit, then you need to repent and believe in the scriptures once again and start applying them to your lives. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those that may not know you, Lord. Father, maybe they know you intellectually. They know of you but their hearts, Lord, are not filled with you. So I'm going to pray for them right now, Lord. If there is anyone here that needs Jesus in their heart, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Lord. If there's anyone here that just needs to be refilled, to receive that passion once again, you know that you're off track and you need to come back. Yeah, just raise your hand and put it back down and I'll pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Amen, Lord. Lord, we've been challenged, Lord. We've been challenged by your word, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. We know it. We know the truth, Lord. Father, would you help us, Lord? Would you help us to make the right choices, Lord? Uh, to freely choose to serve you. Freely choose to trust you. To freely choose to obey you, Lord that we may be blessed, Lord. I pray for those who raise their hands, Lord, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit afresh and anew, Lord, and that you would rekindle that fire again that they had, Lord, when they were first saved, Lord. I pray for those, Lord, that were too scared to raise their hands, Lord, but they, they need more of you, Lord, right now. I pray that you fill them, Lord, because you know. I pray for those, Lord, that are, are not being obedient to your word, Lord. They know what they need to do, but they're not doing it, Lord. I pray you stir them up. You make them uncomfortable. 
I pray you bring them to a point, Lord, where they finally cry out to you and say, okay, Lord, I'll do it. It's only out of love that you chastise us, Lord, and correct us. Lord, we thank you for the work that you're doing here, Lord. I pray that you would find us faithful, Lord, to continue your work here in Mariloma, Father, in this area, to reach out to this community, Lord. Lord, we're there. We're almost there, Lord. We need the laborers. We need the commitment, Lord. Not wishy-washy men and women, Lord but men that have a passion for the lost, Lord. Passion for this community, Lord. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.